am so ready to talk about the books that I read in March. I can't believe how quickly this month went. I, it's blowing my mind. Like I feel like it was just recently, the beginning of March, and we were just starting out the month, and now it's the 31st. So I have a lot of books to talk about this month. I read 18 books. I don't know what's going on. I can't explain it to you. I've been in my audiobook era recently, but I've kind of felt it start to slow down in the past like couple of days or like at least the last week. So I don't know if this like 10 plus book thing a month is going to continue, but for right now, I am enjoying it, even though it makes me really intimidated every time I have to sit down to do a wrap up. I'm just like, oh no, I have like 10 plus books to talk about this month. And it's just, it's a lot to remember. It's a lot to keep up in my brain. I think already this year I've read 44 books. Most of them have been audiobooks. I will be transparent about that. However, that's just still blowing my mind because I've always been an audiobook person like for the past couple of years and I've never gotten this many books per month. I mean, there was that one month a couple of years ago, I read like 22 books or something like that, 21, 22, but that was a like rare occurrence. This just does not happen to me. So I don't know if we can like expect this for the rest of the year, but for now, I mean, March, March was a great reading month. I also did a few themed TBRs within this month, so I will leave the links down below to all those videos, and I probably won't talk too much about them like in depth in this video, but we are going to get to all of them right now, so let's get right on in to this video. The first book that I read in the month of March was actually part of my like birthday TBR, which is where I read books written by people with my first name, Alexandra. And so the first book that I read was Days of Distraction by Alexandra Chang. And I gave this book a two out of five stars. I actually initially gave it three out of five stars, but then sitting with it a little bit longer, I decided to lower it down to two. I wasn't a big fan of this book. I felt like it was trying to do way too many things at once. It kind of gives me the vibes of like a Sally Rooney or a Nisha Dolan. And I think those books also kind of had the same issue where it was trying to do too many things at once and the characters were just so not engaging at all. And I love Sally Rooney, so I don't want to drag her too much, but I just didn't like conversations with friends. So let's be clear about that because I do like Sally Rooney. I just don't like her first book, but I definitely can see this being in the ranks of conversations or even Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan. So yeah, didn't really like any of those books. This kind of goes along in that group. So it just wasn't for me. I was really disappointed. The next book I read was also part of that TBR and that was Nothing Is Wrong and Here Is Why by Alexandra Petri. And this is a collection of essays that are satirizing the American political system, specifically within 2016 and 2020, those years. I ended up giving this book a four out of five stars because I actually really enjoyed it. I have been finding quite a few new like essay collections that I've liked because the first one that I read was Trick Mirror back in 2021, 2020. Gosh, I can't remember when I read that book. I read Trick Mirror quite a while ago and I didn't personally like it. So I was a little worried that I might not like essay collections, but recently I have found quite a few that I do like and this is one of them. I wasn't sure if I was going to like the political satire, but I actually really enjoyed it. So I do highly recommend that book. Taking a break from the Alexandra books, we go into my other theme TBR, which was all of the Bridgerton books minus one. If you've seen my Bridgerton video that I posted about two weeks ago, I talk about all eight of the Bridgerton books that I read and that's out of nine books in the series. I didn't end up reading Simon and Daphne's book mainly because I did enjoy the first season but I wasn't super in love with Simon or Daphne and I just felt like I kind of understood their whole story. I didn't really need to go into detail. 
I didn't really care to see any of the changes that were made so I just decided not to read their book. <laughs> that might have been pretty annoying in the video but I think I explained it well enough. I didn't really have any interest in going back into Daphne's story. So the first Bridgerton book that I read was The Viscount Who Loved Me. That is the second book and it follows Antony and Kate Sheffield and now the second season of Bridgerton has come out. I absolutely loved it. I'm thinking of possibly doing a review of the second season but I don't know if it's too late now. Maybe I'll still do it so if you're interested in hearing my thoughts about season two let me know down below. I really enjoyed this book. I gave it a three out of five stars. I really didn't go over three stars for any of the ratings on the Bridgerton books mainly because I feel like they're a little problematic. I feel like the author herself is pretty problematic and I just didn't feel right within my soul giving them any higher than a three stars and you can disagree with me on that. It's fine. It's just Goodreads. I don't take it too seriously but I just wanted to clarify that going forward. The second book that I read was Romancing Mr. Bridgerton and that is the fourth book in the series. I did not go in order and that is Colin and Penelope's book. I absolutely loved it. This is actually the only book out of the series that got 3.5 stars. <laughs> so you can tell I really enjoyed this book and I'm recently realizing that a lot of people did not like Colin and Penelope's book and I'm just like why? It was so cute. It was clearly the best one out of the series. I might be biased. I really love Penelope Featherington and I love Colin Bridgerton so much just in the show and in the books. I love them. I just I think they're fantastic and I cannot wait to see what Shonda Rhimes does with their characters in the following seasons. So I'm so excited. And then the third book that I read was To Sir Philip with Love and I gave that book one star. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm also realizing that people actually like that book. I'm shocked. I am shocked and confused. I can't understand enjoying Philip as a character. Eloise is absolutely lovely, beautiful. I actually prefer Eloise in the books compared to the show. I think they went a little too like stereotypical feminist in the show and I feel like the Eloise in the books was a bit more of a well-rounded character in my opinion. So I do prefer her in the books but unfortunately I just hated her book so much. It was it was such like a death of the character. It was really sad. The fourth book that I read from the Bridgerton series was An Offer from a Gentleman. This is the Cinderella retelling. This follows Benedict, the second brother, and also his love interest Sophie, whom I love. I will fight anybody who says that they don't like Sophie because she is the best. I love her. She's amazing. And then I read When He Was Wicked, which is Francesca's book. That one... I was met about I wasn't like fully invested in Francesca's story and I do blame it on the fact that we just don't get a lot of Francesca through the series and I know that's not like the character's fault but we don't get a lot of her so I didn't really form a connection with her. It was kind of the same thing with Benedict in the series like in the book series because we don't get a lot of Benedict and he doesn't have like this huge personality. He kind of just feels like Antony, just like different slightly, like tweaked a little bit. Um, I do prefer Benedict in the show. I love second season Benedict. He is so amazing. He has a real personality and he's just so funny and so much fun. I love him. I think that they give so much better personalities to the brothers in the show. It makes them so much more distinct. And then the next book that I read was It's In His Kiss and that is Hyacinth's book. And I did like this one actually. I was surprised by how much I liked this one because it was kind of the same thing as Francesca. Like we don't get a ton of Hyacinth. We do get a little bit more but not quite as much as like Eloise or Daphne. Um, but I did love Hyacinth and I think that her season, if we ever do get to it in the Netflix show, I'm gonna be obsessed because I love her love interest. I think he's fantastic and I don't know. I really liked this book. I thought it was fun. I thought it was fresh. So yeah, three stars. And then I read On the Way to the Wedding, which is Gregory's book and that one was messy. If you've seen my video, you know my thoughts. I did have some, uh annoying <laughs> comments in that video telling me that I was just kind of dumb for 
headcanoning everybody in that book as queer, but hey, it's my headcanon. It's my video. It's my channel. I can headcanon these characters however I feel like. That's why it's called a headcanon. But yeah, everybody in that book, I headcanon as queer. I love them. I would fight for them. It's the messiest book out of the entire series. I did give it, I think, a two out of five stars, I want to say, but what can you say? And then because of the audiobooks I was reading from the series, they included the second epilogue in every single book, so I also finished Happily Ever After, The Bridgertons, this is the collection of the second epilogues, and I did really enjoy that. I gave it a three out of five stars. I loved all the epilogues. Like, there wasn't really an epilogue out of the series that I didn't enjoy. So yeah, we love the Bridgertons. We love the series. The books are so much fun. I would keep in mind that the series is a little problematic. The author is pretty problematic as well, and there's not a lot of diversity in this series. The only time you're ever going to get an actual on-page canon queer character is in Gregory's book. Okay, moving on out of the Bridgerton series, I am going back into my Alexandra mode and I read Lore by Alexandra Bracken. I actually DNF'd this book. Um, I didn't end up rating it because obviously I DNF'd it, so no rating, but um, this had a promising beginning. I had a lot of expectations once I started this book. Like I don't feel like I had a ton of expectations going into it, but it wasn't until I started it where I was like, oh, the writing style is actually pretty good. I'm interested in the characters. Okay, this is, you know, it's giving me a little bit of something. But pretty quickly as I progressed into this book, I started to get really bored. I didn't really care about the characters anymore. It just felt like it was dragging on and on and I just could not get myself to continue with this book unfortunately. And this year I'm really giving myself permission to DNF pretty much whenever I want to. There have definitely been times in the recent years where I have forced myself to get through a book that I really hated and then it would put me in a slump and it would be awful. So I don't want to get into a slump anytime soon so I'm letting myself DNF books and moving on. So yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of this book unfortunately. I know that there are some people who really enjoy this book. I wish that had been me. I'm very jealous. The next book that I read was Chlorine Sky by Mahogany L. Brown. I don't think I ever talked about this book really in any of my vlogs or videos recently, but this is a novel in verse and it was absolutely beautiful. I gave it a four out of five stars. This book chronicles the life of a black teenage girl and it follows her interactions with her family, with her classmates, with her friends, with boys, and also with her love of basketball. I am super tall. I am 5'10", and I have been 5'10 since around the 6th grade, so I was a pretty big basketball player back in the day, like before 8th grade. I think I stopped, I think I quit in 8th grade. So I could totally relate to this book in that sense, and that's kind of what drew me into reading this. And I also loved the family dynamics in this book. She has a very complicated relationship with her mom and with her sister. You know, she loves her family so much, but they also get on her nerves and they're not very nice to her. But there are also those moments, obviously, where her family has her back or she has her family's back. And I think that that's very realistic for family dynamics. I think a lot of us could probably relate to the conflicted feelings of both loving your family and also not really liking them all that much, especially when you're in your teenage years. Like that is a really tough time, especially with family. So I think that this book portrayed that so well and especially like her complicated relationships with her classmates and her friends where some of her friends are just not very nice to her and turn their backs on her and you know throw her under the bus so I also really enjoyed that portrayal as well. I thought that that was a great book and I highly highly recommend it. If you're looking for a novel in verse this is a great option. We all know what happened with this next book. I think you can tell by what I'm holding. It's not a book. <laughs> It's the book I lost and it's Who is Maud Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. I lost this book. We all know. We, I only have this. <laughs> the dust jacket. 
um, which I think is kind of apt for this book because obviously as the title states, who is Maud Dixon? Who is the book that I'm actually supposed to be reading? Where is it? We lose Maud Dixon in this book. I also lost the book in real life. So yeah, this is a sort of contemporary thriller. It starts off a little bit more as like a contemporary novel and it slowly devolves into a thriller and it was so much fun. I gave this book a four out of five stars. I feel like there could have been some tweaks to the book to bump it up to five stars, but I did really enjoy this and I think it was great for a thriller because I'm not much of a thriller reader, honestly. It's, it's not my genre, it's not my thing, but I do really wanna get into thrillers and I think that this is the kind of thriller that I'd be interested in where it's not just like from the get-go clearly a thriller. I want it to kind of be more of like a contemporary book in the beginning or literary fiction or something like that and then slowly but surely the thriller or mystery aspects start to come out and I loved this book. It was so much fun. I could not put it down when I started it. I think I started the audiobook at around like 6 or 7 p.m. and I don't think I finished it until like 2 a.m. I was obsessed. I thought I was gonna go to bed. I turned it off. I'm like okay I'm gonna go to bed. I'm fine. And then I immediately turned it back on and could not fall asleep. It was so much fun. The next book is I'm So Not Over You by Kasoko Jackson. And this is another book that I unfortunately DNF'd. I was so, so bummed when I DNF'd this book because I really, really wanted to like it. But there was just something about it that I just was not feeling. I felt like we were kind of going in circles a lot throughout the first half of this novel. And another thing that kind of put me off of this book like I was going to overlook it but then there were some other issues that I just like did not love and that was the over usage of pop culture references the first few I was like okay this is fine like I like pop culture references it's not that big of a deal like I'm not fully against them but then by the next like dozen or so I was like wait a second why are there so many references in this book? Like, do we need them all? The answer for me is no. I feel like pop culture references can be used well in order to create a setting and like a feeling of a certain time period of when like a book is set. I don't think that we need them on every page. I don't think that we need them every time we talk to certain characters. Because like I know that when I talk to my friends we're not constantly talking in pop culture references. Actually me and my friend really don't have the same pop culture interests so we rarely talk about pop culture when whenever we're together. So I was just like, this is getting pretty annoying. And then when I was reading some reviews for this book, I kind of found out some things about the ending that like I just was not interested in and would eventually ruin the book for me. So I decided I should DNF this book. I don't own it, so I feel pretty good about DNFing it. <laughs> I just got it from my library. So it wasn't that big of a deal, but unfortunately I did have to DNF it. I don't think by any means that it was a horrible book. I think that there are a lot of people who would actually really enjoy this book. It just unfortunately wasn't for me. I am interested in seeing what else Kosoko Jackson has out, but yeah, not for me. The next book is Meet Me in the Margins by Melissa Ferguson. And this was an adult office romance, which I actually am starting to realize that I might like. I didn't think that I was going to like romances that are set at work, but then I watched The Hating Game, the movie. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And then I also recently watched Set It Up, which is also an office romance movie, and I loved it. So reading Meet Me in the Margins was like super fun for me. I think I gave it a four out of five stars. And basically it follows the main character. She works in publishing and she works at this very small, very elite publication and they're the kind of publisher that produces only the highest of highbrow titles according to the synopsis and the main character Savannah actually wants to write romance so she's writing her romance novel secretly and not telling anybody at her publishing house and one day she puts her manuscript in her little secret hiding place and when she comes back to get it she finds that there are edits on her manuscript that weren't there before and so she kind of starts to become pen pals with this secret editor whom she has no idea who it is 
and I loved this book. I thought it was so cute. It kind of had that You Got Mail sort of vibe to it, but I actually really enjoyed that her and the love interest weren't really at odds with each other like they didn't hate each other or anything which kind of happens in those sort of stories one of my favorite old classic movies is in the good old summertime and that kind of has that same sort of you've got mail situation and it's like a hate to love thing i love that movie but i also really enjoy when it's not necessarily hate to love so yeah i thoroughly enjoyed that book <laughs> The next book that I read was actually a short story by Toni Morrison and that is Recitative and it actually has a foreword from Zadie Smith and I thought that this was absolutely fantastic. I got it as an audiobook arc from Libro FM and I loved it so much. It was a very quick read and probably one of my favorites of the year. It's a really interesting short story because it follows these two girls who are kind of abandoned by their families but they're never actually described physically and you're never quite sure which one is supposed to be white and which one is supposed to be black and throughout the story you're kind of challenged in your biases towards race and it really highlights the complexities of race in America. I feel like this short story and also the introduction by Zadie Smith should 100% be required reading for literally everybody, especially in the US. It really gets you to think about race and I absolutely 100% recommend this book, this short story. Um, I guess I can say this book because I do recommend it as like a pair. Like you need to read the introduction and you also need to read the short story. They can't really be read separately. If you can get your hands on this specific book, that's perfect. The second to last book that I read was one that I had been meaning to read for a while and I ended up absolutely loving it and that is Beautiful World Where Are You by Sally Rooney. Oh my gosh, this book blew my mind. It was amazing, iconic, legendary, definitely Sally Rooney's best work to date. I'll read you the synopsis in the inside flap of this dust jacket. It says, Alice, a novelist, meets Felix, who works in a warehouse, and asks him if he'd like to travel to Rome with her. In Dublin, her best friend Eileen is getting over a breakup and slips back into flirting with Simon, a man she has known since childhood. Alice, Felix, Eileen, and Simon are still young, but life is catching up with them. They desire each other, they delude each other, they get together, they break apart. They have sex, they worry about sex, they worry about their friendships and the world they live in. Are they standing in the last lighted room before the darkness, bearing witness to something? Will they find a way to believe in a beautiful world? This book owns my heart. Everything about this book just... It was beautiful. It was so, so beautiful. I read Normal People, I want to say last month, right? Was that February that I read Normal People? I loved it. Five out of five stars. This one, if I could, I would give it six out of five stars. It was that good. I just loved this book. <laughs> um, I feel like her books get progressively better. I read Conversations with Friends last year. Wasn't a big fan of it. I think I gave it three out of five stars. Then I read Normal People, loved that book, <laughs> and then I read this one and it just blew me away. Like there's so many beautiful quotes in this book. I love the complex relationships in here, not only romantic and sexual relationships but also friendships. I think this book definitely had my favorite female friendship within any of her books. Um, this one just hit it for me. It was just perfect. It was phenomenal. I, I don't even know if I could say anything else about that book that like I wouldn't just be repeating myself. <laughs> and the very last book that I read in the month of March was Broken Horses by Brandi Carlisle and I gave this book a 4 out of 5 stars. So this one obviously is a celebrity memoir. It was actually a much faster read than I expected it to be. I did listen to it as an audiobook and I do highly recommend the audiobook. However, I do read audiobooks at two times speed and this particular one has music kind of after every single chapter. So I did frequently have to slow down <laughs> the speed of the audiobook 
every time there was like music or singing happening in this one so um while i do highly recommend the audiobook i do want to warn about that but yeah i really loved this one it was very raw it was very honest i really liked how she didn't try to sugarcoat her life she's definitely lived a very hard life and it was really tough growing up in her house and they were you know really struggling they were very poor um and she also had a lot of health issues growing up so I really liked how she highlighted all of those issues within her book. I really liked how she didn't shy away from the truth. And it definitely did make me a lot more interested in her music. So I really enjoyed the celebrity memoir. I want to read more of them. I do have Jessica Simpson's memoir and I really want to read that one too. So hopefully I can get to that one soon. All right, so that was my entire wrap up for March. In the comments down below, let me know if you've also read any of the books that I read in March. Let me know what you read, what you liked, what you didn't like. I want to know all about it. And if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, go ahead and follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Goodreads, Storygraph, TikTok. All the links are going to be down below, and I will see you all in my next video. Bye! Oh, oh, oh.